Hey everyone, this is <clears throat> the introduction to module 2.1. We're going to start covering the cellular level of organization here. Um, just like the previous PowerPoints and for the future PowerPoints and lectures coming up, you can see the learning outcomes listed here. Um, most of these learning outcomes will be seen again when you get to the study guide. Uh, use those study guides as a direct correlation to what you may see on the unit exam. So again, we're getting into the basic cellular level of organization here, um, just an intro into cells. A lot of this stuff is going to be a refresher course for you from your first biology class. We may go into a little bit more detail than you got into in biology, especially with things like the plasma membrane, but a lot of the organelles I'm not going to cover in this lecture even though they are listed in the PowerPoint, just because I provided you with that uh, organelle sheet that you can find on the Sakai site. Um, but just an introduction, cells are the smallest living unit in the body, and they could not be examined until the invention of the microscope, obviously because they are microscopic. Each cell can, maintains homeostasis at a cellular level, so it maintains that homeostatic balance within the cell, and that creates a homeostatic balance outside of the cell as well. So these coordinated activities of the cell allow that homeostasis at higher organization levels. So when you first start out, cells generally tend to be unspecialized and non-differentiated. And it's only through specialization that they develop the characteristics that become <clears throat> what make them unique. Most cells are going to start from a single fertilized ovum, which is just the egg mixed with the sperm. And this is an important concept. Cells in the body of sexually reproducing organisms can be either somatic cells, which we consider body cells, and can be considered diploid. Remember from the prefix sheet that you can also find on the Sakai site that diploid or the prefix of di meaning two. So it has a double chromosome number. And that's produced through the process of mitosis that we spoke about in the last unit, or sorry, my apologies, the last module. Examples of those cells are your muscle cells, your nerve cells, things like that. And you can also have your gametes or your sex cells so when you look at the study guide, you'll see somatic and sex cells. And here's your um, difference between those two. And your sex cells are haploid, meaning they only contain one copy of the chromosome. And they are produced through meiosis. So continuing with cell differentiation, you start off with the most general. And you become specific through that differentiation process. So that first cell division creates a smaller partial of the cytoplasm. And through cytoplasmic differences, you increase the level of specialization. As I said, those cytoplasmic differences cause specific genes, which are locked inside the DNA, either to turn on or turn off, which causes the development of special characteristics. Most undifferentiated cells inside the body are known as stem cells. You can see that here. And from stem cells, depending on which genes are turned on or turned off, you can develop into different types of cells with all unique characteristics. As we talked about, cells are the smallest units of life and have varying degrees of organizational levels. One of the most important concepts in this part of the module is going to be the function and features of the plasma membrane. Um, so some of its functions include physical isolation, so it protects the cell. The regulation, or my apologies, the regulation and exchange of an internal environment. So basically what that means is bringing things in and release a product back outside of the cell. It is sensitive to the environment, meaning that it can respond and react to changes outside of it. Structural support, meaning that it just provides structure to the tissue that it is made up of. The lipid bilayer, again, provides an isolation, so it can selectively choose what comes in and what does not. And then proteins perform most of the other functions for things that can't freely move across that lipid bilayer. I would pay special attention to this picture in particular. <clears throat> 
So as we briefly discussed in the last module, the phospholipid is a molecule that contains a polar phosphate head. We already talked about polarity as well, which is a hydrophilic and a nonpolar lipid tail, which is a hydrophobic unsaturated fatty acid. Remember back to the first module where we talked about unsaturated containing the double bond. Within the cell membrane, there are several other features and <clears throat> a new vocab where we can learn here, moieties. So there are anchoring proteins that attach to the plasma membrane in order to structure and stabilize its position. You have recognition proteins, and these are things that allow the plasma membrane to sense and communicate with cells around it, as well as respond to chemical changes in its environment. You have enzymes, which are specialized proteins that are involved in chemical reactions. Um, you have receptor proteins, again, that help to bind to some of the chemical changes in the outside environment of the cell. Carrier proteins, which help to move things across the plasma membrane that wouldn't normally freely move across it. And then channels, which are specifically integral proteins. You can see an integral protein here, how that differs from a peripheral, because it's a channel that allows products to freely move across. So that's going to be less selective than your carrier protein. And we'll get into that a little bit more here in just a moment. The glycocalyx is a, an important feature of the cell membrane as well. Essentially, without going into all the specific details inside of here, um, when you have carbohydrate complexes inside the, the plasma membrane, almost all the time they're involved with some other macromolecule like lipids or proteins. So the glyco portion of these molecules are almost always outside of the cell and dangle freely out into the outside environment. Um, there are other carbohydrate compounds instead of the glycoproteins or the glycolipids that you can uh, call proteoglycans, which are mainly carbohydrate substances that are bound to small protein cores instead of large protein bodies with a carbohydrate tail. And so in some way, shape, or form, there are these free carbohydrate chains that just float randomly outside of the cell membrane. And that little coat, that thin layer of that uh, carbohydrate is what we call the glycocalyx. <clears throat> and they have several important functions. Many of them have a negative electrical charge, which helps to increase the selectivity of the plasma membrane. The glycocalyx also helps the cell attach to the glycocalyx of other cells. So it allows for intercellular communication. In addition to that, the carbohydrates also act as receptor substances for binding hormones. We talked about cholesterol a little bit in the last module as well, being a very important molecule. Uh, cholesterol usually gets a bad rap um, for its role in heart disease, but cholesterol is actually vitally important to each cell as it acts as a fluidity buffer for the plasma membrane. Um, basically what that means is that it, it acts almost as a, as I said, a buffer. Think back to a chemical buffer, which reduces um, large swings in pH. A fluidity buffer is going to help the plasma membrane stay relatively uniform despite high and low temperature changes. So at high temperature, cholesterol helps to keep the membrane rigid so that it doesn't melt and fall apart. And at low temperatures, cholesterol helps promote fluidity so that the membrane itself doesn't freeze. You should all know this stuff from a basic biology class as well. But these are the three overall general categories of permeability of membranes. So you have freely permeable membranes, which allow any substance to cross, selectively permeable, which you're going to find in most cells in your body, which only allow a few things to cross. And that's usually based off of size and charge. And then you have impermeable membranes, which won't allow anything to cross. There are a few membrane transport mechanisms, whether they be fluid mechanisms, 
or they be facilitated mechanisms, or they actually require ATP to move across to cell. Involved in that is the integral and peripheral proteins. Um, <clears throat> if you can just associate integral, meaning inside, and peripheral being on the outside, then that'll help you to distinguish between these as well. Again, here's that picture of the plasma membrane, which is important. So integral proteins are permanently attached to the membrane and are typically transmembrane. So that means they span the membrane itself. They have a connection to the opening to the outside environment of the cell and an opening to the inside environment of the cell. And basically they serve several functions. They help um, serve as transport channels for small dissolved ions. They act as enzymes for active transport. They act as receptors and they also provide support to the plasma membrane itself Peripheral proteins are temporary, temporarily attached, which means they are attached at some point in time, and then they detach in others depending on um, the needs of the cell in that moment, and usually attached by non-covalent non means. Um, and they serve a, one major function in particular, which is just intercellular communication. So hopefully you all remember the different types of diffusion and active and passive transport from bio one as well. But simple diffusion is just going to allow small particles to cross the plasma membrane and enter the inside environment of the cell. What controls this is the movement of <clears throat> or energy of the concentration gradient and things are going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration in an attempt to reach that homeostatic balance. Facilitated diffusion just means that it's helped by something, but not necessarily requiring ATP. And this is where those channel proteins come into effect. So it's a little bit more selective than that free um, non-facilitated diffusion that we just talked about, but still much less selective than processes that are going to require energy to move from a low concentration to a high concentration. Osmosis is usually the diffusion of water through the semipermeable membrane down its concentration gradient. So this helps to um, define the idea of tonicity that we talked about in lab. So the concept of tonicity is simply a measure of the solute concentration. Um, we talked about this in the lab as well. So a hypertonic solution is your solute concentration is going to be higher outside of the cell, and you're going to have a higher water concentration inside the cell. This is going to cause water to move outside to try and regulate the amount of water and solute. Um, because water moves outside of the cell, your cell is going to then shrink. In an isotonic solution, that just means that everything's equal. There's going to be no net movement of water. A hypotonic solution means that the solute concentration is higher inside of the cell, water concentration is higher outside of the cell, thus water will move in to try to regulate that solute concentration. It's going to cause the cell to swell. Simply what you have to remember about tonicity, because it can be kind of confusing, is in hypertonic, solutes are higher outside, water moves outside. In hypotonic, Solute concentration is higher inside, water moves in. This can be a kind of confusion concept for students. An active transport is just going to be transport across the membrane that utilizes ATP. Um, usually there's two types of active transport. You have primary active transport that uses ATP, and you have secondary active transport that uses an electrochemical gradient. Remember that because these processors require ATP, usually they're moving against their concentration gradient. So instead of uh, an example of diffusion where things are going to move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, things that require ATP are generally going to move um, things from a lower concentration to a higher concentration, meaning that they just need more of it inside of the cell, but this isn't going to happen on its own. So they have to use ATP in order to pump that stuff inside the cell. An example of that is a sodium potassium pump. This is going to be very important as you move through A&P. We'll talk about this again when we get to the musculoskeletal unit.
Um, so the sodium potassium pump is again powered by ATP to transfer sodium outside of the cell into the cytoplasm and the ECF, which stands for the extracellular fluid. And the pump is also going to transfer potassium out of the ECF and into the cytoplasm. This is a good rule of thumb here. This will not go away. Remember these units, three sodium out and two potassium in. Secondary active transport, one of these is um, an example of this is the co-transport of glucose as sodium and potassium move out. The um, proteins that help to move sodium and potassium in and out also have spots for glucose so that when they're moving sodium in, they have little spots for glucose to fit in there and glucose just kind of moves into the system. So glucose doesn't necessarily require the ATP to move across, but because there's a spot, it will utilize that and the entire process in itself uses utilizes AP, ATP. So it can be considered secondary active transport. Another way that things can move inside of the cell is endocytosis. What happens in this is a large particle that exists outside of the cell or even inside of the cell um, <clears throat> will come in contact with the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane will then envelop that particle and move it inside or outside of the cell. Exocytosis is the outside movement of the cell. Exocytosis is going to be the same process as endocytosis, except in, um, instead of moving things in, it's going to move things out. All right, and that's where we're going to stop this for this uh, lecture. You can go, flip through the rest of these, or, and I'll cycle through as I get to the end of the video here, so you can pause if you need that. But you also have the PowerPoint available for download on the Sakai site. Um, Keep in mind that all of this information is organized into that table for you.